Well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. I'll welcome you to our worship service, and I'll welcome everybody who's watching online. Thanks for joining us. And uh, if you're a guest here this morning, I especially want to welcome you. Right after the service, if you would go to the, um, the guest services, we've got a gift for you. Part of the things that's in there is our certificate to our cafe so you can get some free food. And then during this week, I'm going to write you a personal card and just say, I was so glad that you were here to worship with us today. But if you're looking for a church home and, and you need some information, we would love for you to consider prayerfully making Central Community your permanent church home. So before I get started, I want to say our preschool, pretty cool, huh? Isn't that awesome? So um, our preschool teachers are here. Would you please stand over there? Would you just stand if you're a teacher, administrator, everything? Would you just stand? Congratulations. Good job. You know what? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to milk this thing for everything it's worth. People are going to say, so where do you pastor at? Oh, I pastor at the church that has the best preschool in the, in the city. Well, where's that? Central Community Church. All right. Anyways, great job. We're so proud of you. Keep up the good work. Two in a row, right? Coming next year? All right. Okay, so we're in a series right now looking at Christmas through Mary's eyes. And one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to learn that as Mary, who had the best seat in the house for Christmas, as she learned and walked through this Christmas, we're trying to figure out what her meaning was. And as we understand more about what her meaning was in this story of Christmas, hopefully Christmas is going to make a little bit more sense or we're going to understand it even more. So my challenge for you today is, is that my prayer is that as we talk about this Christmas story, that you would find your place in, this, in the picture or in the story. Where do you fit in? I hope that you get into this story and you, you literally live this story with us today, okay? And so I want to begin by asking you a question. And here's a question. How many of you would consider yourself a trustworthy person? Now, if you want to raise your hand, you can, okay? And maybe the, the best thing to do is ask the person sitting next to you, right? Okay, would you consider so-and-so a, a trustworthy person? But I think we would all agree, it's important to be trustworthy, isn't it? All right, so here's what I did. I did, a, I did some research, and I wanted to find out what were the characteristics of someone that is considered trustworthy. And I mean, in one section, there's 25 different things. In another one, there's five different things. But I found four characteristics of a trustworthy person that I found in each one of these examples. And I just want to share with them with you this morning. And so if you are a trustworthy person or you are on the road to becoming a trustworthy person, these are four things that you need to be able to, people need to be able to say that you have. Here's the first one, okay? You need to be honest. I mean, that makes sense, Right? You need to tell the truth. Here's the second thing. You need to be open. In other words, you're open to share things with others, but you're also open to receive maybe some criticism or something, some constructive criticism, okay? Here's the third thing. You gotta be transparent. In other words, you can't be fake. You gotta be who you are. You can't try and be something that you're not. And then the last one is this. You have to be willing to sacrifice. Now, that's an easy one, isn't it? Because when you sacrifice, you're a person who put others first. And so those are four things about, about being a trustworthy person. Now, I think we would all agree, for any of us who are in any relationship, trust is the bedrock, right? It's the foundation of the relationship. If you're in a relationship right now and trust is not in it, guess what? You do not have real relationship. Take a look at this. Trust develops over time, requires a level of reliability in knowing you will always be there in understanding. Did you hear that? Trust doesn't happen overnight. You have to work on it. You have to build it. And one psychologist said, the recipe for trust or being trustworthy is this. It's slow and steady over time always wins. Would you agree? I mean, your track record is critical to your being able to be trustworthy. Now, I want you to think about this. Have you ever met someone, or maybe I'm talking about you, have you ever met someone, or, or maybe as I'm talking about you, that you've had trust issues? 
Have you ever, have you ever gone out with a girl or maybe you've gone out with a guy and, and it's just the relationship is lacking and there, there's just trust issues. You remember that? And somebody says to you something like, you know what? I just have a hard time trusting people. Well, people who say that are people are probably that have been betrayed. People who have been, you know, there's somebody, somebody let them down, okay? Maybe they got a Dear John letter or whatever. But I want you to look, look at what, what psychologists say about the real issue is about people who have trust issues. Are you ready? Now, before I show you this, I want to tell you, don't shoot the messenger, okay? Take a look at this. Here's what it says. In my experience, I see the root of trust issues within relationships stem from a lack of trust in one's ability to be fully truthful with themselves. I would agree with that, wouldn't you? I mean, I know in times and relationships I've been where I've been jealous or whatever, the issue isn't the other person, it's me. You know, I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, the Bible is filled with people that had trust issues. Eve did. She didn't trust God's word. Neither did Jacob, neither did Sarah, neither did Hagar, neither did, and the list goes on and on, right? Even Zechariah, they didn't trust. And you know what I found is that every time when someone didn't trust, it always led to sin. Here's what I want you to understand about God's word. God's desire is for you and I to trust him. Now, how many of you have read this in the book of of the Gospel of John? Remember what John said when John was asked, why did you write your book? Here's the explanation that he gave. Check this out. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So there you have it. John says... All these stories, all these examples that I've given you about Jesus, I've given you so that you would believe. He's writing to people like you and me because this is what he's saying. There are many of you who didn't know who Jesus was like I did. So what I'm doing is I wrote down all of these things and I wrote down just a few because I want to build a track record for Jesus. Jesus can be trusted. And so do you believe him? Because if you believe in him, you will trust in him. Didn't Jesus even ask that question himself? Do you remember after Lazarus died and he's on his way back to Bethany and Martha meets him? Do you remember what she said to him? Jesus, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Wouldn't it be nice if he just stopped right there? But he didn't. What did he say next? Do you believe this? Do you remember John 14? He's getting ready to leave all of the apostles. And the apostles are sad. And what did Jesus say? He starts off with these words, trust in God. Okay, that was pretty common. But then he says, trust in me, in my father's house. And so what I want to focus on today is trust. Do you trust God? You know what I've learned? The people who have walked a relationship with Jesus and have lived a life of trust, when it comes to that moment that the Lord is about to call them home, there is peace. You know why? Because they believe and they trust. Stand with me out of respect for God's word. I'm gonna read the Christmas story from Matthew chapter one, and I'm gonna read verses 18 through 25. Listen to these words. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. Now remember, Luke is the Christmas story from Mary's point of view. Matthew is the Christmas story from Joseph's point of view. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, 
Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. This is God's word for God's people. Let's pray together. In my experience, Lord, When there are times when I've had to trust you, I have to admit, sometimes it's difficult. It's difficult because I see through my eyes rather through than the eyes of faith. God, help me not to waver, but instead be found faithful, just like Joseph. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. If you go down in Matthew a little bit farther, I think it's Matthew chapter 22 about Jesus in Jerusalem. He's been doing his ministry for quite a while now and he's doing some teaching. And the teaching that he's giving is there are different ways that you can reject God. There's a group of people that followed him everywhere he went. Remember that? They were part of a group called the Sanhedrin. They were made up of two groups. There were the Pharisees and there were the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, remember, they didn't believe in the resurrection. And remember I told you, that's why they're sad, you see, okay? Now, I didn't come up with that. That's from an old Bible teacher that I taught with. But they're sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. Jesus had just answered their question, and the Sadducees walk away with their tail between their legs, and now step in the Pharisees. And the Pharisees think, okay, we're going to be the ones who trap Jesus. And so one of them steps out. And all of these people are around listening to him. And he says, Rabbi, teacher of all the law, which is the greatest commandment? And remember what Jesus said? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, what was Jesus saying there? He was telling all of us this. You need to trust me. You love me, you make me first in your life, you say you believe in me, so what I need to see in your life is trust. Mary did, and she was barely 13 or 14 years old. Do you remember when Gabriel came to Mary and he said, you who are highly favored, Remember, she didn't understand why she got this greeting, but this is what Jesus was saying through the angel. He was saying, you are being filled up with grace. And after everything was said to her that she was going to be pregnant, that she was going to have a child, do you remember what Mary said? May it be to me just like you said. Wow, that's like writing God a blank check, isn't it? And that's what she did. Here's what she said. She said, God, I love you. I know who you are. I believe you and I trust you. So my life is yours to do with whatever you desire. Wow, that's trust, right? So let me just ask you, could you say that? Could you write God a blank check with your life and say, Lord, my life belongs to you. Do with it whatever you see fit. Let me show you what one of the Old Testament prophets says about trust. Take a look at this. This is from Jeremiah. My blessing is on those people who, there it is, trust in me, who put their confidence in me. They will be like a tree planted near a stream whose roots spread out towards the water. It has nothing to fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no need to be concerned in the year of drought. It it does not stop bearing fruit. Now, as soon as you hear that, 
I hope what you're thinking about is Psalm 1, right? Psalm 1 talks about a tree being planted by the water. And so what I want you to understand is this. Jeremiah is painting a picture for all of us, and he is saying, if you trust God, this is what your life is going to look like. Number one, you're going to be like a tree whose roots extend into water, and water is life. And because your roots extend into water, guess what? As a tree, you will be fresh and you will be secure. You will stand firm in whatever you're doing. And he goes on to say, and that means even in difficult times, when there's a drought, you will have water, you will have everything you need, you will stand strong, you will stand firm in difficult times. And even in those difficult times, he says, you will still bear much fruit. And that's what God desires from us, right? God desires for us not just to bear fruit, but much fruit, right? So what is he saying here? Here's what he's saying. Not trusting God is sin. Did you hear that? Not trusting God is sin. So let me ask you this. So how do you know when you're trusting God? It's simple. Obedience. God knows you are trusting him when you're obedient. Now, here's why. Do you realize that when you are obedient to God, God is obligated by his own name. He swears by his own name that when we are obedient to him, you know what the result is? Blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. He's obligated to do it. He even swears by his own name. Look at this in the book of Deuteronomy. All these blessings will come on you. In other words, go through Deuteronomy 28 sometime and see all of the blessings that come to you simply because you're obedient. He says, all of these blessings will come on, come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and you will be blessed in the country. So what is God telling us? He's saying, when you trust me, when you believe me, in other words, when you live your life according to what I've asked you to do, guess what? You will always finish on top, and you will never finish at the bottom. But you also need to remember this. Delayed obedience equals delayed blessing. So let me ask you something. Where is it in your life that God has asked you to do something that you haven't done yet? Do you realize God is waiting to bombard you with blessings, but he's not going to give you the blessing until you are obedient? All right, now, let's get to our story. Here we go. Back to Matthew. Take a look at this. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant. Uh Uh-oh. Through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is the Holy Spirit. Here's the first thing I want you to remember. Here's what we learn about Joseph. He was a righteous man. All right, now, ladies, for you that are in here, your husband your boyfriend, your significant other, whatever, how many of you ladies want to be involved in a relationship with a man who is a righteous man? Raise your hand. Okay? I hope all you guys looked and saw that, because I know even though my wife is at home sick, she's standing on top of the table waving her hand like this, okay? (laughs) Love you, dear. So what does it mean to be a righteous man? Three things. Number one, you have to walk humbly before God. What does it mean to walk humbly before God? It simply means this, gentlemen, your life is not your own. And you know what? At any point in time, when God chooses to use your life, he is free to do so. That's number one. Here's number two. Pay attention to the commandments. You see, Joseph, the Bible tells us, was a man, he's a righteous man because he paid attention to the commandments. In other words, he was obedient to the commandments. So here we have a righteous man. He walks humbly before the Lord. He's obedient to the commandments because the Bible says, how will they know you are my disciples? How will they know that you love me? Because of your obedience. And then the third thing is this. He sought God's direction. In other words, he knew God had a plan for his life. So gentlemen, 
in this room, if you are a righteous man, you need to walk humbly before God. You need to recognize that your life is not your own. It belongs to him. You need to pay attention to the commandments. You need to make them what you live your life by, and you have to always realize God has a plan for you. You're not a mistake. You didn't just happen to come about. God created you for a reason. Now, God knew that Joseph was a righteous man, which meant he was always going to do the right thing. Joseph was never going to make a decision based on emotions because he knew emotions could lie to him. He was simply going to make all of his decisions based on what was the right thing to do, and the right thing to do is always God's way. Now, here's what you need to know. All Joseph knows is this. His wife is pregnant. That's all he knows. You see, in those days... When they were at the stage of marriage where they were, they could never be alone together. But Joseph has found out that Mary's pregnant. So guess what? What's he going to do? Well, the Bible tells us that he was going to divorce her. Why? Because that's what the Torah said. You see... Joseph paid attention to the law. He knew the law forwards and backwards. And the Torah was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And the Torah tells us that, you know what? Because of what Mary did, she was an adulteress. You know what? It was by law that he was to divorce her. But here's something else you need to know. You know what the penalty was for what Mary did? Death by stoning. Can you imagine the dilemma that Joseph's in right now? Now, there's one good thing that comes out of this. You know what it is? There was something very important that they needed to have in a court of law, and that was you needed to have two witnesses, and there are no witnesses. So the Bible tells us that it was Joseph's plan to divorce her. Remember what the words were? Quietly. What does that mean? It means this. In those days, all Joseph had to do was write a certificate of divorce get a couple people that as witnesses to sign it, and then he could deliver it to Mary, and it was all signed, sealed, delivered. It was all null and void. There was no more relationship. Can you relate to that? I mean, think about this. Mary and Joseph are excited. A few months ago, they're getting married. Mary was just simply living her life, preparing to be the wife of Joseph. Life is good for her. This is her childhood dream. She's marrying the man that she loves. And what about Joseph? Joseph is building a home for them. And all of a sudden, one day, Gabriel comes and tells Mary, hey, listen, Mary, you who are highly favored, guess what? You're going to become pregnant by the Holy Spirit. She goes to visit her aunt Elizabeth. She comes back. Guess what? She's got a little pouch there. She's pregnant. And one day, Joseph is at home and somebody says, Joseph, did you hear the news? What? Mary's pregnant. What? What? Joseph loved Mary. This was was the woman of his dreams. Can you imagine the hurt and the pain that he had? This doesn't sound like something Mary would do. How could she do this to me? Can anybody relate to having your life turned upside down with something you never expected or saw coming? Maybe you lost a spouse. Maybe you got a health diagnosis. Maybe there's relationship. Maybe there's financial problems. Maybe you lost your job. But did you ever see what was coming? And now you find yourself in the middle of this mess and you are dying. And the only excuse you can come up with is this. What did I do, God? I was being perfectly obedient to you. And now my life is turned upside down. Do you remember what the Bible said about Joseph? It said, Joseph considered these things. In other words, he pondered. In other words, what Joseph demonstrates is this. Even in the midst of all of these things that don't make sense, Joseph Joseph demonstrates a cool head in the midst of chaos. 
Now, the question is, so what is God doing? I'd kind of like to know that, wouldn't you? Well, it looks to me like God is testing Joseph. Think about this. Think about your child. Would you entrust your child to someone you don't know? Would you entrust your child to someone that you don't trust? I guarantee you, with one of my children or one of my grandchildren, I'm going to say, "Um, I need a resume, and I need references. You see, I don't know you, and I need to know your track record. You know why? Because you are about to be put in charge of the most, the most, the best blessing, my greatest treasured possession that I have, and I need to know about you. And here's our heavenly Father, and what's He about to do? He's about to now to entrust His Son Jesus. And does He need to know? Does He need to know that Joseph is a man He can trust? The answer to that is no, but Joseph needs to know that. You see, what Jesus knew about Joseph, what God knew about Joseph was this, is that Joseph would always do the right thing when the right thing wasn't the easy thing. Do you understand that? And he needed Joseph to know, I have trust in you, Joseph. Take a look at this. Joseph trusted God based not on what he saw with his eyes, but on what was based on his faith. So let me ask you this. So what was the right thing to do? Well, what did Joseph do? He married her. And do you realize that when Joseph married Mary, he brought all the shame of the town of Nazareth upon himself? Now it's not just Mary who's pregnant. It's Joseph saying, no, I'm going to marry her. Why? Because Joseph created the impression that he was the father of the baby. And he was doing the right thing by marrying Mary. Whew. What a guy. I mean, why did he do that? He was protecting Mary's dignity. He was protecting his wife. He did the right thing. So let me ask you this. So how do we know he passed the test? Look what the Bible says here. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Finally, after Joseph demonstrates faith, now he gets the dream. Oh, hey, Joseph, it's me, Gabriel. I went and talked to Mary. Guess what? She's right. It's not pregnancy by another man, it's by the Holy Spirit. Oh, angel, man, I knew there had to be some explanation, right? Now, because Joseph obeyed, because he demonstrated trust, guess what? God now entrusts him with his son, but the story's not over with yet. Take a look at this. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. Take a look at this. Joseph trusted God when he didn't have all the details. So here's what God tells Joseph. Hey, Joe, Herod is trying to kill my son, so I need you to take him to Egypt. That's it. Now, I'm sitting there, okay, so if I'm Joseph and I'm thinking, okay, Egypt, man, that's a big place. Where in Egypt? And how long are we going to stay there? And by the way, you do remember that Egypt is an idolatrous place. This is the place of independence. This is the place where your people started from, and you brought them out of there because you wanted us to be dependent. Are you sure me? you want me going there? But that's not what happened, was it? Joseph went. Now, listen to me very carefully. Do you wait till you get all the details before you are obedient to God? Because if you are, you will never be obedient to God. Because you know why? God's never going to give you all the details. Here's what I want you to understand. God will give you men and women. He will give you what you need so that you can demonstrate faith and you can be, and, and you can, you can be obedient to what God has given you to do. Does that make sense? There are many times in my life where God said, guess what? You're going to Florida. Where? I'll tell you that when it's time. 
But when God gives us a direction, when he gives us something to do, his expectation is immediate obedience. But you know what we want to do? I'm going to wait till I get all the details. And then when I get all the details, then I'll do what God has called me to do. You know what? You're never going to get all the details. Because here's how God works. God will give you what you need so that you can make a decision in faith and then demonstrate that faith through your obedience. I want to end this by giving you an illustration. Would you turn off the lights for me, please? I brought with me a flashlight, okay? And if you don't remember anything, I want you to remember this. You see, this is the way God works in our lives, just like this flashlight. I mean, think about this. If I had a flashlight and somebody said to me, why are you waiting? Why are you just standing there? And I say, well, I've got my flashlight on and I'm waiting till the light shines all the way home, then I'll begin my journey. You would think I'm, I've lost it, right? Think about you when you get in your car and you turn on your headlights. Do you sit in the car and you wait till the headlights get all the way home and then you begin? No, you don't, do you? What happens? You walk in the light as you have light. So watch this. This is how God works. Every step I take in obedience, the light moves forward, doesn't it? And every step I take in obedience, the light continues to move forward. And that's exactly the way it is. Your headlights may shine 50 yards out. You know what? When you get 50 yards, you get 50 more yards, right? And so here's what I want you to remember. Turn on the lights, please. This is what I want you to remember about when God asks us to be righteous men. Here's the plan. Here's what he's telling us to do. Walk in the light as God gives you light. That's it. Walk in the light as God gives you light. And as you walk in the light and as he gives you light, guess what? He will give you more light. That Joseph becomes a bigger hero every time I hear this story. And the more that I dive into this story, the more I understand what this man did was amazing. But because he was obedient to God, he demonstrated his faith, and God used him in a mighty way. Joseph was never a guy who was going to be out front. You know why? Because we never hear about him, do we? Where was he? He was always in the background. But you know what we know about Joseph? And that is this. He was a strong man. He was a sturdy man. He was a righteous man because he walked humbly before his God because he paid attention to the commandments and he knew that God had a plan in his life and he had given his life to God. And so how did he live that light? He walked that life, he walked the light as God gave him light. And that's my prayer for you and I. Let's walk in the light as God gives us light. Amen?